you want to know how to buy off politicians and get involved in the political process? That's exactly what I'm going to do in this video. So make sure you stay all the way to the end so you can get the at least four different points that I'm going to go over on how to become a lobbyist and all of the secrets that apparently nobody else is willing to tell you. So the basic game of lobbying is what? To get government officials to do what you want, whether that's through money, media, marketing, votes. But I'm gonna take a step back and show you some of the very basics of what lobbying is. How does it start? How do you do it? How do you become a lobbyist? It's actually incredibly simple and it has to do with relationships and you kind of also need to li live in some kind of democratic system specifically the us or europe where it's incredibly helpful because that's where it's called lobbying if you're not in the west it's more than likely called bribing so to become a lobbyist there's a couple ways on there's a couple ways that you could do it but the best way is to simply get involved in the political process and start building relationships let me give you an example of how most lobbyists are created say for example you have a good friend who wants to run for office and they have a good chance of running for office. They're in a blue district and they're a Democrat or they're in a red district and your friend's a Republican and you decide, hey, I wanna help him. So what you do is you sign up for his campaign, maybe you knock doors, maybe you help him fundraise to the point where if they win, you get hopefully a position in their administration, in their office, whatever that looks like. And that could be, listen, city council, county commission. So you can lobby any elected position at all. But the cheapest way to get involved is you simply help the person who's running so that they owe you, you develop a relationship and you can become an asset. Now, how this normally works is once you help them get into office and you spend a good time in their administration, assuming that they win, you have a few options. Some of those options are you can then quit. You have a good relationship with that person and then you start becoming the middleman. You start balancing favors with getting the politician that was your friend or maybe still is your friend money. So for example, you work for them for two years, you retire, you don't wanna work for them anymore, but you decide, hey, I have some bills that I want passed. You have their number, you can text them anytime they want, and you tell them, hey, you know, I want to start my own lobbying firm. I want to know if I can get you campaign donations through certain clients, if you'd be willing to sponsor legislation for me. More often than not, the politician is always going to say yes, because the number one goal of a politician is not being an administrator, is, is not enforcing legislation or trying to pass bills, it's raising money. Because in a democracy where elections are every two to four years, if you're not raising money, you can't win. Because money, in large part, with some caveats is what wins elections. So just right there, the basic human process of being a lobbyist is nothing other than relationships and balancing those relationships between favoritism and being a value add. So of course, if you come out of a legislative office and you're not able to scrounge up money, to further help and build the relationship that you've built by being in that office, then you're gonna have a lower spot on the favor giving ladder of that politician, even if you are friends. And listen, friendship can get you pretty far. And the more friends that you have, the better off that you will be but you still need to perform and you are incentivized by the way to give that politician money because if they do lose, you've now lost access. And there's gonna be another version of you with the candidate that maybe beats yours that is now going to step in your role as a lobbyist. And so this is actually one of the cheapest ways to become a lobbyist is you start early and make an early bet on a politician and you just become useful to them. What a lot of people do is they assume it has a lot to do with money because a lot of money can buy step that favor process. So say you've been with a politician for six years and you've built a very good relationship with them and other people, you decide to leave, you become a lobbyist and you start trying to pass legislation and earning favors. Now I come in and I am a multimillionaire and I just decide to plop $2 million into someone's campaign fundraiser. Boom, I have instant influence. Now, of course I don't have total influence, right? Because money only gets you so far, they could still really dislike you and they still have to account for voting. So I could plop $2 million down, tell you, I want you to pass this policy and the policy might get you unelected and you might just tell me to screw off, right? Even though I just gave you a bunch of money. However, if I give you a bunch of money and our policies are aligned, I become your friend very quickly. And you kind of have to give me what I want because you need to out fundraise your opponent. See, one of the basic theses of lobbying is providing cash 
to where it needs to be, where it needs to go, an allocation of resources, to simply put it. Because at the end of the day, politicians are doing nothing but fundraising constantly. They're like startups that never stop seeking cash. They're startups that, in a sense, can't ever be quote unquote bought out or sell or have an exit plan. Well, their exit plan is stepping away and becoming the lobbyist themselves, which is step two of becoming a lobbyist is you could become a politician. Becoming a politician is one of the best ways to become a lobbyist because you get ingrained in the process, you know all the rules, and you make a ton of friends. When you're helping a politician, you are their biggest asset, but they are your single access point. When you are the politician, now all 400 plus members of your state house or the five members of your county commission or city commission, all of those people become your friends and you develop huge relationships to the point where once you leave office, you can now text any of those people that you want. And that is what it's about. It's about the relationship. So that is why the longer politicians are normally in office, the stronger their lobbying power, the more ingrained in the establishment that they quote unquote become. Because if you have to think about this from a very realistic point of view and not from kind of the bias of lobbying is corrupt, is when you're trying to get something done and you develop friendships with 100 people who are currently in power, well, if 50 of those people leave, your influence just got halved, right? So you are incentivized to make sure as many of your friends are in place as possible. Whether they're good for the country or good for your city or county commission, whatever it is, if you want influence, and as a lobbyist, your influence then translates into money, you want everyone you know to stay in power. Because as soon as they're out of power, you now have one less relationship which is one less piece of leverage for you to pass a bill. That is why the quote unquote establishment, kind of the swamp, kind of enjoys people staying in power for so long. If you're a Mitch McConnell of the world, or if you were, for example, the Kevin McCarthy's of the world, even more radical people like the AOC's and Matt Gates, they are so entrenched because they're either in safe districts or they've been there so long that no one actually wants them to leave office because as soon as they leave office, all that leverage goes away. If I were to look at someone like AOC, who's been in office at least now four years, she's got a lot of relationships and people have had to deal with her no matter what. So whether I want her out or not, I'd actually probably rather just have her stay in office because at least I have a good relationship with her. That's what the lobbyists around her are going to be thinking. So lobbying has everything to do with one, the way our political process is run, because frankly, the fact that we are a democracy that elects people every two years means that congressmen and women are always having to fundraise in order to beat their opponent. And as long as there is a need to fundraise, there will be a need for lobbying. And lobbyists are the ones who are going to discreetly or publicly dedicate resources to these campaigns in order that they can officially run. And that is one of the biggest parts that I tried to tell you guys is that really you might not actually dislike lobbying, you might actually just dislike the democratic process because frankly, there's no way around this. There's no way around as long as you have democratic elected officials every two to four years, there's no way around them not needing to raise money to campaign. And as long as they need money, they're gonna need money from somewhere and who's going to give them that money? It's gonna come from individuals, it's gonna come from uh, corporations, it's gonna come from very wealthy individuals individuals and lobbyists are the ones that kind of handle all of that because to even get individual donations you have to market to the people so that is how simple it is to actually become a lobbyist you have to build the relationships now where it gets hard is that takes time it takes a lot of time. In fact, if you were to start today, you might not reap the reward of lobbying in the next five to 10 years. You have to play the long game. And that is the difference between a lot of these institutions, these big businesses, the Black Rocks of the world, and a lot of individuals, is the big institutions understand that they are not looking at the next five years. They're not looking at the next 20 to 30 years because that institution will most likely be around here for that long of a time. Think back to some of who the biggest lobbying powers are today. And you think about, I don't know, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Bill Gates. They have been lobbying for a very long time. They have been doing it for at least 20 years and they have been allocating cash and resources like no other. 
of course, to get government contracts, which once again, lobbying, you can think of as influential when you're passing legislation, but it's also influential when you're passing business because government loves doling out government contracts. And if you know, say for example, on the military side, if you wanna go on the military industrial complex, you wanna think about, well, who's, who's head of Senate Armed Services? Who's head of the House Committee that has to do with the military? I get to know them. I become a lobbyist for them. I start giving them campaign cash and they let me know, hey, by the way, uh, there's going to be a contract coming up for the Pentagon or a contract coming up for this, that, or the other thing. So a lot of what people hate about lobbying is simply it's about relationships and relationships compound, which means the more relationships you have, the more relationships you are going to have because it's like a web people will constantly connect you to where you want to go. Once again, that's a longer term investment. If you have no relationships, then you have to start from square one. But that's one of the things that I always teach people is starting from square one can still net you pretty well. Just one relationship can lead to at least three others. And if just one relationship leads to just three others, and each of those three relationships leads to three others, very quickly, you can start to build kind of your network of political influence. Now, of course, once again, all of those politicians are going to be running their own circuits, going to be trying to vie for their own influence, their own own personal goals and their own friends and maybe even themselves might get unelected or cause scandal where you might not be able to talk to them or their influence might wane where they do something and now the house or the senate decides well we don't want your public face on any legislation but that always comes around all you have to do is wait and a lot of people understand that no one in office ever really goes away they always end up in some other spot and that's one of the most important things that you can understand about lobbying is you never burn a bridge because anyone involved in the political process normally wants to stay in the political process whether it's about power money or for a lot of us it's just about passion but once you understand that these people never go away you never burn a bridge because you know those relationships will always come back and could potentially be useful somewhere else when a politician resigns and loses office a lot of times their staffers stay and remain somewhere else so once again just keep in mind that it's not always even about the vehicle, which could be the politician. Eventually your network starts to grow into the people who are under the politician and what some people would call the administrative state, which is a bunch of lower level people, middle management who never leave and aren't bound by election. It is an unfortunate reality. And I'm not saying that this is a good or a bad thing, but to use the levers of power and maneuver and really have influence in government, which is very hard for an individual person to do because of the time constraints in which we have in our daily lives to do so, knowing those people and building the relationships is the key to everything. And it really is the epitome of not what you know, but who you know, unless you know the rules of the game. And that is the other thing about lobbying is a lot of these lobbyists who have been there for a long time, these lobbying firms normally outlast the politicians who they've been working with, understand the rules better than the politicians themselves and can use that as a way to manipulate the politicians into doing as they please. Because a lot of times the lobbyists will convince the politicians because they know the rules so well, certain things that they can do that the politician doesn't actually understand is stabbing them in the back. So really it's unfortunate that in our democratic system that lobbying is one of the ways in which the democratic system can be used to then literally fight the will of the people, what the voters actually want. But as long as we have the current system that we are going to have, lobbying will not go away. And if that's the case, it's better for you to understand how it works and better for you to get involved than simply sit back and complain.